It's always good to start a new book study with you tonight, so let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. Wednesday nights we go uh, verse by verse through the Bible, and we are starting a new book study together, the book of Hebrews. So obviously God loves coffee, because he brews. All right, that's the joke for the night. If you need a Bible, you can raise your hand, and uh, one of these fine ushers will be glad to hand you a Bible if they have one in their hands, they'll hand it to you. It's page 846 in the church Bibles, Hebrews chapter one. Let's just go to prayer again before we jump into our study tonight. And then we'll we'll give a little bit of a background to the book and then study through chapter one tonight. Lord, thank you for the privilege of gathering freely in your house to worship you And we pray that you would continue to be glorified now as we open up our Bibles and study Hebrews chapter 1 tonight. Give us understanding, Lord. And uh, we just thank you that you have chosen to reveal yourself through the pages of your word. And I thank you for each person here tonight and those who are watching online. We commit our Bible study to you now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. So a little background on the book of Hebrews before we actually jump into uh, chapter 1 together this evening. The date of the book uh, is probably sometime before 70 AD because there are references to the sacrifices which implies that the temple is still standing. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by uh, Emperor Titus Vespasian in the year 70 AD. It has uh, never been rebuilt. And so the the temple ground there in Jerusalem still is without a Jewish temple. And the fact that the writer of Hebrews refers often to sacrifices, uh, it is an indication that the temple is still standing. So the date of this letter has to be before 70 AD at some point. The writer is unknown. We don't have any introduction, any salutation uh, by any particular writer, and so we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Now, um, a lot of Bible scholars believe Paul did, but we just have no way of knowing that. Um, it, there are some, there's some speculation that maybe Apollos wrote it, maybe Barnabas wrote it. We really don't know, and to be honest with you, it doesn't really matter. Because if you really believe that all of the Bible is inspired by God, then whatever human vessel he chose to inspire through is is secondary to, to the fact that God is really the ultimate author of his word. But we really don't know. Just traditionally, uh, a lot of people think Paul, but um, there's great debate about it. So um, forgive me if I might by accident in the course of teaching through Hebrews say, you know, in verse so-and-so, Paul says, uh, you know, I'll try to catch myself because we don't really know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, The recipients of this letter are, as the title implies, Hebrews, uh, but these are Christians. These are Hebrew Christians. In other words, these are Jewish believers. Uh, Today, we would call them Messianic Jews. Um, and, And so that's the audience, that's the target audience here. These are Hebrew Christians or Jewish believers, but this this is good for all of us, but that happens to be the target audience. And the purpose of this letter, as you see there on the screen, is to exhort and encourage believers in general, but in particular the recipients of this letter, to remain diligent in their faith and to not become spiritually lazy or legalistic. And so the kind of the theme uh, verses related to this purpose are found in chapter 6, uh, verses 11 and 12. This is what it says. Uh, we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. So, so that's the general theme here. You know, don't get spiritually lazy, which is, you know, the tendency for all of us, kind of get in a rut, you kind of just get used to things, and, you, and you're going through the motions, and it's easy to become sometimes spiritually lazy, or in particular, to fall into legalism. Now, the reason why that's an important thing to note is because the audience, the main recipients, being Hebrew Christians or Jewish believers, they had a tendency 
to fall back into legalism because they grew up with tradition, they grew up with history, and they grew up with a certain way of doing things. You know, it, it, it completely rocked their world when, when Jesus dies on a cross and, and then for the first time the Jews have to begin to realize and, and transition from uh, law to grace, uh, sacrifices to the sacrifice, um, multiple lambs to the lamb, and all of this is very foreign to, to Jewish people. So you have to bear in mind that, you know, they're now being told, hey, all of these things pointed to Christ, but these things are n no longer the basis for your religious activities because Jesus now is about relationship. And so it was very easy for them to just kind of fall back into religious tradition instead of a relationship with Jesus. And Jesus has fulfilled all of these things. And, and for them to transition out of that is very difficult. Some of you have come out of you know, various traditions yourself, perhaps. If you, if, if, those of you who are, you know, church is foreign to you, and so you're here and you have no kind of church background, then you have, you're approaching Approaching this from one perspective. But for, for those of you who have church backgrounds, maybe your tradition, you know, uh, taught you differently and you're having to kind of relearn things. And that's, that's why this letter is addressed to these Hebrew Christians, because they're having to relearn things. You know, they, they thought it was all about getting righteous through sacrifice. It was, it was getting righteous through works. It was, you know, trying to get on God's good, good side. And, and then the reality is Jesus Christ dies on the cross. It's not about having to perform, having to do good things. I mean, we want to do good things in response to, but it's all about Jesus dying on a cross, free gift of salvation, uh, it, and we're saved through faith, not of work. So, you know, all of that can, is difficult for, for people who have up to this point approached God through a religious system. And now they're being told it's no longer the system, it's the Savior. And so to transition out of that is difficult. And so uh, in particular, the exhortation here is you know, stay diligent, don't get spiritually lazy, and don't fall into legalism. Now, just to show you uh, how many different times throughout the book of Hebrews that the writer exhorts um, the, the, the recipients, I'm going to put a list up here on the screen for you of all these many different exhortations, just a sampling found throughout the book of Hebrews, okay? So in chapter 2, 1, pay more careful attention. Also, do not drift away. Chapter 3, 6, hold on to courage and hope. 3, 12, do not turn away from the living God. 4, 14, hold firmly to the faith we profess. 6, 1, go on to maturity. 10, 35, do not throw away your confidence. 10, 39, do not shrink back. 12, 1, run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. You get the idea that all through the book of Hebrews, there's just one exhortation after another to address this tendency we have to just get spiritually lazy. So strong language, strong exhortation here to just continue to encourage us in our faith and in our walk with the Lord. Now, some key words, I didn't expect you to write all that down, so for you note-takers, you're furious, like, ah, don't go on the next, it's okay. You can go back, look on the teaching archive on our website, and pause me. Um, but I'm going to move on. Key words to understanding Hebrews, and this is important. Words like better, that word used 11 times in the book of Hebrews. Superior, that word is used four times in the book of Hebrews. Greater. That word is used seven times in the book of Hebrews. And the writer here is establishing the fact that all these things point to Jesus, that Jesus is better, Jesus is superior, Jesus is greater than. The, the writer here of Hebrews is going to constantly be comparing Jesus to people and things that are inferior to warn us that we should never settle for anything less or to go back to what we thought was good. You know, good is the enemy of best. Good is the enemy of best. And Jesus is best. And sometimes we settle for less than best because we think, well, it's good, yeah, but it's not best. And 
Jesus is infinitely better, infinitely superior, infinitely greater than anyone or anything. And so the takeaway from the book of Hebrews should be don't settle for anything less. Always pursue that which is best, and the one that is best is Jesus. Again, you have to understand for Jewish believers, there was always this pull from the past. There there was this emotional, historical, and traditional pull to fall back into a religious system rather than a relationship with Jesus. And so the writer of Hebrews here is going to say throughout this letter, Jesus is better than. Jesus is better than. And, and I'll just highlight the list in advance so you can see where we're going. Uh, spoiler alert, but I just want to make sure everybody understands. These are the things that the writer of Hebrews is going to be addressing throughout the letter. He's going to be saying Jesus is better than the prophets. We'll talk about that one in chapter 1 tonight. He's, he's going to say Jesus is better than the angels. He mentions that. We're going to mention that also in chapter 1 and into chapter 2. He says Jesus is better than Moses, which is, that's, that's startling to the Jews. But he is. That's chapter 3. Jesus is better than Joshua. That's chapter 4. Jesus is better than the high priest, the function of the high priest in the temple. Jesus is better than any earthly high priest. That's chapters 5 through 9. Also in chapter 9, he talks about how Jesus is better than the tabernacle. You know, they put a lot of pride in these things. The Jewish people did. They, put, they would put pride in Moses, and, and they would put pride in, in the fact that there's a high priest interceding between them and God. They would put pride in, in the temple or the tabernacle. Okay, all these things that they took pride in, the writer of Hebrews is going to dismantle and say, well, Jesus is better than all this, including in chapter 10, he's better than the law and the sacrifices. And then in the last uh, few chapters that remain, uh, 11 through 13, uh, the writer of Hebrews is going to just make some uh, final exhortations and some encouragements in the last couple of cha- chapters. But, but this is where he's going. Now, when the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is better than all these things, he doesn't mean that these things are bad. He's not saying the prophets are bad. He's not saying angels are bad. Moses is bad. Joshua is bad. You know, so don't think better than in the sense that you know, these other things that he's comparing Jesus to are somehow bad. These things are good. He's just saying Jesus is much better than these good things. You know, it's kind of like, you know, vanilla. Vanilla ice cream is good, but Chunky Monkey is better. Ah. Have, you ever, have you ever had Ben and Jerry's Chunky Monkey? You know what I'm talking about. It slays me every time. But anyway, but that's the kind of thing he's saying. He's, he's like, it's, it's, not that, it's not that these other things are, are bad. These things are good, but Jesus is better, and these good things are not the source of your salvation because Jesus is far superior to all these good things. And so he starts here in chapter 1 by saying that Jesus is better than the prophets. So if you have your Bibles open now after that introduction to chapter 1, You can see with me in verse 1, he says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. So there's a lot packed into just those first two verses. So let's pause there for a moment. And again, he begins here by comparing Jesus better than the prophets. He said, listen, and, and again, he, he, he writes to Jewish people who understand their own history. He goes, the prophets, they're good. God used the prophets. Clearly, he spoke through the prophets at various times, in various ways, at, in, 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 at, at different times and places. In fact, Peter, the Apostle Peter, would write in his second epistle, 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21, he says, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So, so you know, Peter underscores the fact, and the writer of Hebrews is not taking anything away from the fact, that prophets heard from God and spoke the Word of God. They heard a message from from God and delivered that message. But what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, while the prophets gave a message, Jesus is the message. And so that when he shows up on the world scene, 
He speaks in a way that is more profound than the prophets because the prophets were speaking the Word of God, but Jesus is the Word of God. I mean, this is John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That, that Jesus is superior to the prophets because He is the personification of the Word of God. And, and, and thus, He's greater than the prophets. And Jesus even said in John 12.49, He says, For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. And I marvel at that verse there in John 12, 49, because it's, it's such a clear indication how tuned into the Father Jesus always was. He didn't say a single thing that the Father didn't tell him to say, and he didn't even, he was careful to say it in the certain way that the Father told him to say it. He said, I, he said, I don't say except what the Father tells me to say and how to say it. So when you, when, you, when you think about how the prophets were inspired by God, well, great, they clearly were, and they spoke forth the Word of God. But Jesus comes onto the world scene, and He is the world of, Word of God, and so thus He is superior uh, to the prophets. And, and what then the writer of Hebrews begins to do is he begins to, through this whole first chapter, talk about how Jesus is greater, and he defines the greatness and, and the superiority of Jesus in eight different ways. And the first way that we see here, uh, right in verse 2, as, as we just already read it, is, is that Jesus is creator. So he's going he's gonna to now make the case for why Jesus is greater than the prophets and why Jesus is greater than the angels, it, just in chapter 1. And he starts with telling us, of course, that, that he is the creator. Because again, in verse 2, it says, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. Okay, now, for those who don't understand, there's one God, but He reveals Himself in three persons, and we see it throughout Scripture. So there's God the Father, there's God the Son, that's Jesus, and there's God the Holy Spirit. One God reveals Himself in three different forms or persons. And it's not, He doesn't have a split personality. Every part of the Godhead, every part of the Trinity is co-equal, co-eternal, and has coexisted uh, eternally with, with God and is God. But what the Bible tells us is, is that the second person of that Godhead, Jesus, was entrusted with and uh, was the one responsible for creation of the universe. That Jesus, in fact, is the one who made the universe. That's what the writer of Hebrews says there in, in verse 2. And by the way, this is what Paul says in Colossians 1. Uh, verses, uh, you don't need to turn there, I'll just read to you, uh, in Colossians 1, 15 to 17, which says that He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God and firstborn over all creation. For by Him, that is by Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. By the way, keep that phrase in, in mind too, because the writer of Hebrews is going to mention that as well. But, but Jesus is Creator, that part of the Godhead entrusted with the wonderful privilege of creating everything. Jesus is Creator. So that's why He's a little bit more superior than the prophets, because He's not just the Word of God revealed, He is also Creator. And in verse 3, go on with me now, Hebrews 1, 3, the Son, that's Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. And so now what we read here is that Jesus is also divine, because when it mentions that the Son is the radiance of God's glory, the, though the New Testament is written in Greek, the, the Jewish equivalent of God's glory is Shekinah. And Shekinah literally translates the divine presence. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying that Jesus is actually divine. He's the divine presence of God. He is the radiance of God's glory. He shines forth the glory of God, and He is the exact representation of His being. Now, interesting word in the Greek here. The exact representation 
is one word in the Greek, and it's charakter. And it is spelled the same way as our English word character, except in the Greek, it uses a K instead of a C before the T-E-R. Character in, in, in Greek, our English version now is character. It tells us something, doesn't it? Because Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Your character, my character, is the real you. And the character, the character, is revealed of God, the real presence of who God is, through Jesus, the Son. That's the stamp or impress, the exact representation, meaning the, the, the stamp or the, Im, the impress of an image upon another object. It, it is, for example, you know, try to think of it like this. If you're, if you're walking barefoot on the beach, the imprint that your feet make in the sand, that impression is the exact representation of your foot. And so in a similar way, that's how that word is used here, that Jesus is that exact representation of the Father. He becomes the visible manifestation of the divine presence of God. And so he's creator, he is divine, and also in verse, uh, and, and then it, it talks about the, at the end of verse uh, two there, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. Now that's also what, again, what Paul wrote in Colossians 1, uh, verse 17, where he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. You know, it's interesting, scientists are a little stumped. Um, the, the nucleus of an atom contains protons and neutrons. Now, neutrons have no charge, but pro protons have a positive charge. And if you've ever done a little uh, classroom experiment or a little thing at home with magnets, you know that um, two positive charged magnets repel. And so why is it that an atom does not naturally, you know, uh, uh, fall apart? Why is it that it is held together? Because the nucleus of an atom has positively charged protons and neutral neutrons, and scientists can't explain why is it that the nucleus of an atom is held together? So they come up with this term, you've heard it, atomic glue. It's atomic glue. We don't know what to call it, so we're just going to call it atomic glue. Hey, I have a new name for it. It's Jesus. That's what it is. Jesus is even holding the atomic matter of the earth together because he is the one who sustains all things, and he is the one who holds all things together by his powerful word. Now, one day, it's all going to explode. He's going to say, okay, enough is enough. You know, scientists have it a little backwards. The Big Bang is at the end, not at the beginning. And it's all going to explode. There's a new heaven and a new earth. That's for another Bible study. But after he provided purifications for sins, look at verse 3. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So that whole phrase there about he provided purification for sins means that he's our redeemer. That's how he's superior. He's our redeemer. He's the one that paid the ransom for us by his blood on a cross provided for us purification for our sins. He, he redeemed us. He's our redeemer. And then he sat down, notice that, at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, because the work of Christ was complete in the sense of his redemption for mankind. And so the posture of sitting down shows that his work is finished and it's complete. And so he sits down at the right hand of the Father where he presently is seated and he's coming again. But right now he's at the right hand of the Father, the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And so verse four, he became as much superior to the angels. Now he moves on here to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So number four on our list through chapter one, Jesus is superior to angels. Um, this is an important point, by the way, because um, there have been historically uh, many references, even, even biblical corrections, to people who get engaged in the worship of angels. And uh, angels are not to be worshipped. He's going to tell us later on in verse 14 of this first chapter that they are ministering spirits. So angels are sent as ministering spirits. They minister to God. They minister to us. Okay, we can't see them. They're in, unless they perchance reveal themselves to people. 
Um, otherwise, they are invisible. And, and, and yet, as much as the Bible speaks about angels, more than 300 references in the Bible, they are not to be worshipped, and they are not equal at all with Jesus. They are created beings, but angels are inferior to Jesus. And this is not important simply to understand historically, but also biblically, because there are two main religious groups that believe that Jesus is not only equal to angels, but also could be one. Okay, so case in point, um, Mormonism. The, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormonism, teaches that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. Now, Lucifer was a created angel, and Lucifer then rebelled against God. And when he rebelled against God and he was expelled from heaven, the Bible says he, he took as many as a third of the stars with him. Those are also a reference to angels. So about a third, however many that numbers, we don't know. He took a third in this rebellion against God of these angels with him when he was in heaven, was expelled from heaven, took a third of the angels, those fallen angels now known as demons, Lucifer now known better as Satan or the devil, okay? And, and yet Mormonism teaches that Jesus is on par with Lucifer as a spirit brother of an angel, okay? And he's not. Now, this uh, taken right out of, you can, you can Google this yourself. You can go to lds.org, stands for Latter-day Saints.org. Uh, they have an article on their website that I just, two hours ago, pulled right off their website. It's entitled, How Can Jesus and Lucifer Be Spirit Brothers When Their Characters and Purposes Are So Utterly Opposed? Okay, so the headline of the article is that they're spirit brothers. Uh, the, the author of the article is uh, Jess Christensen, uh, Institute of Religion Director at Utah State University in Logan, Utah. And just, I'll just read the first couple of sentences of his article. It says, on fir quote, on first hearing the doctrine that Lucifer and our Lord Jesus Christ are brothers may seem surprising to some, especially to those unacquainted with latter-day revelations. Both Jesus and Lucifer were strong leaders with great knowledge and influence, but as the firstborn of the Father, Jesus was Lucifer's older brother, end quote. Okay, that's right off their website, right off of the first few sentences of this article. Yeah, and, and as I was reading it, like, you know, for those it might be surprising, yeah, uh, especially those unacquainted with Latter-day Revelations, yeah, because those things are not compatible with what Scripture teaches. The, the Bible tells us clearly, and it's like, okay, we need to reread here Hebrews 1.4. Jesus became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Jesus, Yahashua, the Lord is salvation. He is not an angel. He's not equal to angels. He, he is superior to angels. So that, that's a false doctrine of the Mormon church, along with many other false doctrines of the Mormon church. And then the other religious group that also teaches that Jesus is on par with angels is Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that Jesus is none other than the archangel Michael. Two hours ago, I went to the Jehovah's Witnesses website. You can go to jw.org, pulled up an article entitled, Is Jesus the Archangel Michael? And people, well, yes, thank you. The answer is no. <laughs> Let me give the punchline, all right? <laughs> but it was, it was kind of this like write in, people could write in. And so somebody wrote in, is Jesus the Archangel Michael? And then the rest of the article, uh, just, I'll just read the first couple of sentences. Quote, put simply, the answer is yes. So Michael the Archangel is, Je and then the, the end of the article said, quote, so Michael the Archangel is Jesus in his pre-human existence. After his resurrection and return to heaven, Jesus resumed his service as Michael, the chief angel. End quote. These are false doctrines. These are not true. The Bible paints a very different picture of who Jesus is. With all due respect, because, you know, at any given time, there, there can be uh, someone who is Mormon or Jehovah's Witness visiting us. And 
If you are, I'm glad that you're here. But with all kindness and respect, you, you need to know that what you believe in terms of Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. That if you think Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer, or if you think that Jesus is the archangel Michael, you have believed a false doctrine. The Bible teaches that Jesus is infinitely superior to any angel, and it's clear right here in Hebrews 1.4, among other passages of the Bible. And so this is why Jesus is greater than, more superior than, because he is not a created being as an angel. He is superior to angels, just as his name that he has inherited is superior to theirs. If you keep reading with me here in Hebrews 1, verse 5, for to which of the angels did God ever say? Now, you're going to notice that the rest of this chapter is quoting God. And the writer of Hebrews is going to quote Old Testament Scripture, seven different passages. Because the writer of Hebrews, again, is establishing the fact that Jesus is greater, superior than anything else. And he's going to use the Old Testament Scriptures as, to make his case. And so particularly if you're a Jewish believer, this is going to make more sense to you because you're relying on your own Jewish scriptures to, to come to, to the realization of what the writer is, is saying here. So he's going to begin to quote here from various passages of the Old Testament. A lot of your Bibles might have footnotes uh, to show you all the different verses that he's quoting. But he, but, but he starts here in verse 5 by saying, For to which of the, of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father? Now, that happens to be Psalm 2, verse 7. And, and so what he's saying here is, you know, God never turned to an angel and said, you're my son, and no angel ever called God father, because they are distinctly separate beings. And now this is where sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses will push back and they'll say, well, now see, uh, uh, Jesus was created uh, because it says, today I've become your father. And, and the Greek word there, to become, is... is uh, uh, Ganeo, and it, it, if you have a King James Bible, it just uses a single word, begotten, and begotten, or Ganeo in the original Greek, means equality of substance or nature. So he's, it, it's not saying that God, you know, made him as a separate being because Jesus is God, but what he's saying here is that he's the begotten son in the sense that he's completely equal in substance and nature. But he is... Verse 5, God's only son. God's only son. Or again, keep reading verse 5, or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. So God never said that to any angel because the son has a position of greater prominence and superiority than any other created being. Verse 6, and again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, now firstborn it means someone of highest position and honor. Again, it, it doesn't mean he's a, that Jesus is a created being. It, it's a title. It's a title. In fact, the ancient rabbis called Yahweh, called God himself, the firstborn of the world. So it is, it's a Jewish title, but it doesn't mean that Jesus was created. It just means he's, he's someone of the highest position and honor. And so again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. All right? If, if you are the object of worship, it means you are superior than the ones worshiping you. So again, he's making the case here that Jesus is superior to angels because quoting from Scripture, um, uh, uh, quoting from Scripture, this time he's, he's quoting from Deuteronomy 32, that the angels worship Jesus. So Jesus is superior because that's why he's being worshiped. Verse 7, and speaking of the angels, he says... He makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. Talking again, his being possessive of Jesus. These, these angels are servants of Jesus. Jesus isn't serving them. Jesus isn't equal to them. He's greater than. They serve him. Verse, verse 8, but about the Son, he says, God says, your throne, O God, underline that, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. This is what you call classically in, in Scripture interpretation a proof text. 
Because where it says there in verse, verse 8, but about the Son, about Jesus, He, God says, your throne, O God. Notice, the Son is referred to as God right there, right there in verse 8. And so that's next on our list, that Jesus is God. About the Son, He says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. Okay, Jesus is God manifest. Jesus is God in flesh. Jesus is God. In verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you, underline the word anointing you, with the oil of joy. Number nine on our, uh, sorry, number uh, seven on our list is from verse 9, and he uses the word anointing there because Jesus is the anointed one. Now, that just simply means Messiah. Uh, The word Christ is from the Greek Christos. The word Messiah is from the Hebrew Mashiach, and both mean the same thing, anointed one. So when you say Jesus Christ, you're saying Jesus the anointed one, Christos the anointed one. If you say Jesus the Messiah, you're saying Jesus the anointed one, Mashiach. This, the, both those words mean the same, and he's saying to us, he is the long-anticipated Messiah, the one that the Old Testament scriptures prophesied about. He is the anointed one. He was anointed with the oil of joy. In verse 10, he also says, in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth, there he is as creator again, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain They will all wear out like a garment. Okay, again, speaking about the the earth, eventually this this whole earth will completely be burned up. There's a new heaven and a new earth. It's going to eventually wear out like a garment. In verse 12, you will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same. You remain the same, he says, and your years will never end. End. It's the last one on our list here from verse, verses 10 through 12, that Jesus is eternal. Your years will never end, he says here. In Hebrews 13, verse 8, it tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Luke 1, it says, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And his kingdom will never end because he is eternal. And then he adds in verse 13, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? So he's still making the same case. Jesus is greater than all these angels. God never said that to any of the angels. In verse 14, he adds, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? By the way, he he will mention the word angels 14 times throughout the book of Hebrews. Twelve of those times are here in the first two chapters. So he he speaks here about angels, and he ends chapter 1 talking about how they are ministering spirits. Um, And and he's going to talk about entertaining angels unaware in chapter 13. So eventually I will once again tell the only one angel story that I have that many of you have already heard, but we'll, I'll tell that again uh, when we get to it. Um, but, but this is the way he ends chapter 1, again on this note, that Jesus is superior to the prophets, Jesus is superior uh, to the angels, and he's going to go on making his case uh, throughout the uh, rest of the book of Hebrews uh, but these, these are the reasons why Jesus is superior. He's creator, he's divine, he's redeemer, he's superior to angels, he's God's only son, he's God himself, he's the anointed one, and he is eternal. So read ahead, we'll pick it up there with chapter 2 next week. But for tonight, let's pray and give him thanks. Lord, we just worship you and and thank you, Jesus, that you are great and greatly to be praised. You are infinitely superior, Lord, to any person, anything, any being, and we just exalt you. We want you to have your rightful place in our lives as supreme and superior. And I pray, Lord, in our study through the book of Hebrews that if we find ourselves 
growing spiritually lazy. Or in chapter 2, the warning is going to be about drifting. That we will respond to this book by just being diligent in our faith and turning towards you, Lord. And uh, to, to, to stop being lazy in our faith or legalistic in our faith, but Lord, turning to you and growing in our faith and pressing into you, Jesus. And we just worship you and exalt you, Lord. And we just confess that you are superior to anyone and anything. And you are worthy of our praise. We exalt you in this place and we thank you and praise you as we leave here tonight, Lord. That you are our Savior and our Lord and King and Creator, divine and God in flesh. We love you and give you praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen.